Welcome to this module on traditional dry cow. Uh, this module may sound a bit boring, but actually there are many new concepts that we will challenge you with in an area that's been around for a period of time. Remember our phase feeding concept, this would be phase one. We would call this the far off dry cow program, not to be confused with the close up dry cow program. For many of us in the audience, we'd call that the traditional dry cow program, one that's been around for quite a while. Let's quickly set some goals for the traditional dry cow program. Actually, there are six different goals listed here, and they affect different parts or phases of the dairy operation. Number one, utter involution. Obviously, when the cow goes dry, tremendous risk for mastitis and at the time of calving. Second, we have a rapidly growing fetal calf inside this cow. This calf has some very unique requirements and will really pull nutrients from this cow as she gets larger and larger. Body condition score has an impact on cow and future productivity and reproduction. The immune system, put a star by this one. This one is critical. That's the new hot ticket item. How we affect the immune system, her ability to combat disease and disorders can really go back to cow health. Cow comfort, in some cases getting cows off of concrete, getting them onto some type of a dirt or pack can really help cow comfort, especially when she gets heavy with calf. And finally, the new topic, maintaining rumen papillae, the finger light projections in the cow's rumen. So we're dealing with a number of different events that impact cow performance and profitability. In the far-off dry cow group, one of the trick questions is how many dry cow groups did you have as far off? Actually, there's four of them. First of all, we have when the, first, when the cow will dries off after her first, second, third, or subsequent lactation. The mammary system must involute. We want her to stop milking. And in some cases, we need to get her on a very different kind of ration. Then we have the very thin dry cow. This is the cow that may have milked very hard, may have had some type of metabolic disorder, uh, may have been a very high-producing first lactation heifer. We need to add body condition score in the dry period. Then we have just the opposite, the heavy dry cow. This is a cow we don't want to gain any weight, but we must maintain body condition on this cow. And Finally, that springing heifer, the heifer that is carrying the calf but is also still growing, trying to maintain her mature body weight. And so we have four different potential cows out there in the dry cow pen. Well, let's go back and talk about that cow we need to dry off. Certainly, this is a critical time to minimize mastitis risk and other health problems. The first goal is to try to get production down to a manageable level. I used 50 pounds. Some in the audience may want to use 60 or 40, but we've got to get her to secrete less milk. Stopping BST, changing feed, put her in a different group, putting her in a different environment, carefully controlling water, all ways to get her to eat less and to produce less milk. Be extremely careful limiting water, especially in summer heat stress conditions, because you can have tremendous negative effects and actually kill the cow. Once we have got the production down to a manageable level, we should stop milking her abruptly. This is the work out of Florida showing that it clearly minimizes mastitis because you can infuse each quarter and aggressively try to prevent any new mammary infections from occurring. There, we could also seal the teat or continue to dip the teat for several days to minimize exposure to the teat end, and then we should monitor the mammary system to be sure that it does involute. Remember, involution or drying off takes about 30 days. This is hormonal control. We cannot speed that process up. So this addresses the question and how long does a cow have to be dry as a minimum? This is one part of that answer. Another area will be what are we going to feed that cow and how, what is it going to cost us? For many of us here in the Midwest, we call that Mr. Cheap. This is the farmer who says, I can rough her. We'll give her dry cow hay, a little free choice mineral, and a pound of something. That's 75 cents a day, very inexpensive, and that's what you get. 75 cents of performance the next lactation. I argue we have to become Mr. Balance. We need to add another 30, 40, 50 cents a day, put some minerals, some trace minerals, and some other protein in there so the cow, the calf, the immune system is able to handle the challenges it'll see at parturition. And then Mr. Close-Up, which we'll talk about in another module, I'll need another 25 to 50 cents a day to add some other nutrients to help that cow come through that transition time period. So economics is don't cut corners. This is a very important phase because remember, we start the next lactation. Another aspect is to fine-tune rations, simply saying, well, besides the standard I items, what should I consider? Obviously, body condition score. If I'm going to put on a pound of gain on these animals here, it's going to take two or three pounds of extra corn grain equivalent to get the job done. Environmental conditions, if it's 10 below zero, we will need more energy to maintain body temperature than we will when it's thermally neutral. Dry matter intake, if these cows are supposed to eat 28 pounds of dry matter and they only eat 24, we have to adjust the nutrient concentration and a much bigger problem coming now in the Midwest and that's twins. Uh, nowadays typically 8 to 10 percent of our cows are carrying twins and that puts a tremendous added nutrient drain on this dry cow which must be satisfied or she will lose nutrients and body condition. 
How much dry matter should these cows consume? I use the Magic 28 for Holstein cows. That's that 13, 1400 pound dry cow. She should be consuming 28 to 30 pounds of dry matter. But remember, there's nothing magic about that. Obviously, forage quality is going to have a big impact on that. Feed availability and other factors that may limit that or stimulate that number. We need to know it and adjust for that poundage that those dry cows are going to consume. The next series of slides are going to show you our far-off dry cow nutrient guidelines. Again, we'll tweak these and fine-tune them, but typically that 28 pounds of dry matter. Protein around 12 to 13 percent. Part of that number is based on having enough ammonia in the rumen to get optimal microbial growth and utilization of the fibrous portion of the diet. Degradable about 70 percent because the microbe should be very active at this point. 30 percent undegradable intake protein, and about half of that should be soluble of the 70 percent, which would be about 30 percent soluble intake protein in the diet. Energetically, somewhere is in that 60-62% TDN. A net energy lactation MCALs are on 0.63 per pound. Fat levels will not be high. They're very modest. Typically what you'll find in your forages and some of your feedstuffs about 2%. And fairly high fiber diets. That is to stimulate the rumen wall, basically to keep the cow healthy. Somewhere is around 30% ADF, 40% NDF, and an NFC around 30. And that's an important number because if that number gets too low, then we'll see some regression of the rumen papillae and we got to have the room to pill eye there to get adequate absorption after calving. On the mineral side of the equation, some very definite numbers. Some of these will be very difficult to achieve here in the Midwest. Calcium around 0.6% of the ration dry matter. I recognize that is above NRC, but we want some extra calcium in there for older cows because they're less efficient of absorbing calcium. Phosphorus right on the money with NRC 0.26%. Magnesium around 0.16. Some people are cheating that number up a little bit for dry cows. Potassium almost impossible to achieve in Illinois, 0.65%. More about that when we talk about DCAD here a bit later. Sodium is modestly low at 0.1%, 0.2% chlorine, those are NRC numbers, and sulfur at 0.16, and that is for nitrogen sulfur ratios, and that should give us the mineral that we need for the macros. On the micro side, I chose to express these a bit differently. This is the milligrams provided per cow per day through the trace mineral and protein supplements. So I'm not taking anything or counting anything from the feedstuffs. So you'd be supplementing 1,000 milligrams of zinc, and you can read the rest of the numbers here. But these are the levels of supplemented trace minerals for the far-off dry cow program that are force-fed every day to each dry cow. Vitamins, while the list is short, is very critical because it has immune function, much like some trace minerals had written all over them. We would like to see force-fed 100,000 IUs of vitamin A per dry cow per day, 30 to 40,000 IUs of vitamin D per cow per day, and 1,000 units of vitamin E added as supplemental E in the program. If for some reason selenium absorption is poor, we might even increase the vitamin E level slightly higher than what's on this screen here today. Very critical numbers, though, for the dry cow these last two slides. Now, another way to summarize this is to look at some of the other guidelines for the phase one dry cow. Again, in summary, we talked on the protein levels. Here is it expressed on grams per day, and this would be for Holsteins and Brown Swiss. If you're into the Jersey and Guernseys, you reduce this number by about 15%. So 60 to 80 grams of calcium for far-off dry cows, 30 to 40 grams of phosphorus here in the far-off dry cow program. Uh, limit the salt. We would say an ounce of salt will be adequate for dry cows. If you want to go free choice, you can in this phase. You will not do that in phase two. I want the trace minerals and vitamins force fed in some type of a carrier grain mixture, so be sure they get them each day. And then I would like to have about one third of the forage dry matter that these cows get, which makes up the, the lion's share of the diet coming from corn silage because of its advantages on palatability and energy content and stimulation in the rumen and the rumen papillae. Another phase will be body condition score in the dry period. Ideally, we'd like to have these cows go dry with a body condition score about three and a half, and you can jump around that. Some people want to go a tad higher, a bit lower, and you can see the plus minus a quarter of a body condition score, but we certainly would like to be at that point. If you're much below about 3.25, then I would recommend to start putting these cows on a slight increase in body condition score to gain some condition during this dry period. 
Notice I also have another carrot listed here on this slide, and that is the excellent manager can probably handle heavier cows and get better performance and reproductive performance out of those cows after calving. The reason I put the word excellent manager, and that is because these cows are a bit more risk at lower dry matter intakes and problems with fat mobilization and ketosis. So you've got to keep these heavier cows out of trouble. If you can do that, boy, you can really get them rolling. Average to poor managers, or if you want to minimize that potential risk, then you're going to get them down around 3 to 3.25. Another aspect of body condition score will be what is the range in the dry cow group. Here are two different herds in Illinois. They both are averaging 3.5, which is right on our target number. But do you see the problem in the first group? We get an average of 3.5 by having some cows that are way too thin at 2.25 and some cows that are way too heavy at 4.50. So on the average, we're okay, but we have, we're in trouble on both ends. The second group, notice they also have that ideal or targeted 3.5 body condition score, but we get that by having all the cows between 3 and 4. And that's my guideline when I walk out to your farm, look at your dry cow pen, I would like to see all the cows in that range of 3 to 4 because it's much easier to to manage, plus we should have fewer problems at parturition and holding production after calving. So again, the key is look at ranges and understand why some of these cows are low. If a cow is a 2.25 because she had twins and had problems in the previous lactation, I understand that. But if we have a whole bunch of 2.25s and we don't have a reason for it, then I think we're in trouble. Another pet peeve of mine will be what I call dry cow ration killers. And very simply, they'll make sense to you. We don't want moldy feeds. Moldy feed will impact the immune system and the liver. So there is no place in dry cow rations for moldy feed. I'm not sure what you're going to do with it, but don't give it to my dry cows. Second of all, I don't want low quality forages because it slows down rates of passage. It slows intakes. It regresses the room and papillae. I lose some very valuable nutrient space and time in that cow's diet. And thirdly, the philosophy, well, we're just going to feed cows cheap. These cows are going to rough it. We're going to put them out behind the dry cow barn. A very poor philosophy because 60 days later, we will pay the price when we have metabolic disorders and poor performance in the first 60 days after calving. Another aspect will be heat stress, and we'll be talking more about this in some of our other modules, but there's been some good work out of Minnesota saying that heat stress on dry cows does impact cow performance. It will decrease dry matter intake. It will decrease calf weight, which is a signal to you as a dairy farmer. It will impact the passive immune system, decreasing its response to disease, and there will be increase in metabolic disorders. So again, what type of protection are you giving the dry cows under heat stress so we minimize this risk? Does this sound familiar? Sometimes coming out of a hot summer, our dry cows and our fresh cows just don't respond until October, November, and all of a sudden, our cows really hit the road running. Some people think it's due to corn silage fermentation. In other cases, these dry cows have been impacted under heat stress in August, September, and until we get dry cows coming through a cooler time period, we don't see this good performance and results. Well, let's then summarize this module and saying what are some of the real take-home messages. Certainly, number one, my bias would be I would like to have my far-off dry cows getting 25 pounds of corn silage. Number two, I want quality forages that have at least a calculated net energy greater than 0.55 mcals of dry matter. Thirdly, I would like to have some long forage. This is primarily baled hay in the diet to maintain room and fill and to minimize some risks as we get closer to calving. Number four, I want the body condition score about 3.5, and if it's not there, we'll bring it there. And number five, force feed a high quality vitamin and trace mineral package. I think if we get these things all accomplished, we now will have a very good phase one feeding program, and we're ready to move on to the next dry cow phase. Thanks, and have a good day.